Election College, Episode 18, The Election of 1840. In this episode of Election College, The Panic of 1837, The Whigs Unite, and Tippecanoe and Tyler too. Let's throw a political party. Face it, the political scene sucks, but did it always? It's time for Election College, and class is in session. Now, your hosts, Jason Goff and Ben Smith. Hey everyone, I'm Jason Goff. And I'm Ben Smith. And thanks for joining us for yet another episode of Election College. Let's get into it. So, Ben. Yes, Jason. The last episode, Andy Jack. Yeah. Remember him? I do remember him. He was um, he was a president. Yeah. He selects his successor, and he does it early. And he's like, hey, Marty, come here. I got a sweet deal Marty. for you. <laughs> Marty, I think you should be the president. <laughs> so, of course, Andy Jack is real popular. And Marty, like other people we've seen in the past, is totally running on the coattails of his of his predecessor. In this case, it's Old Hickory, and he wins in 1836. Old Hickory, how'd you like to be named after an old tree? That sounds like a great idea. Mm-hmm. I would love it. And as a matter of fact, you know, Ben, I was just in Nashville. Mm-hmm. Everything is Old Hickory this and Old Hickory yeah. that. Yep, it absolutely is. They're really proud of him. Jason Old Pine Tree Golf. Yeah. Did I call I you that. Golf? Your name is. I've known your name for 27 years, and I just called you by the wrong name. Why'd you do that? I don't know. <laughs> 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 uh, anyway, the Whigs are in 1836 when Marty is running. They're a disaster. And. I mean, that we should only assume that's going to continue for the length of Van Buren's term. I mean, the Whigs are awful. Van Buren's the best, right? Right, forever, because that's what happens. Whenever a party loses, they have zero chance of ever recovering. Um, there's just absolutely no chance. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So the Whig party is basically, they're dead. Yep, never to be seen again. So Marty announces his... Uh, during his campaign during 1836, that he's going to follow right in the footsteps of his illustrious predecessor, Jackson. He even goes as far as to retain all but one of Jackson's cabinet. Yeah. And Ben, you remember how Andy Jack hated banks and paper money? I sure do. Pretty funny. And that's the reason he's on the $20 bill. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Somebody was really using some irony in that situation. I'm positive. I know. It's kind of like I'm wearing a t shirt right now that says 100% Canadian. Yeah. Uh, I'm not. No, no. But anyway, so some economists are blaming Andy Jack because of his policies for causing the panic of 1837, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But Van Buren actually reversed some of Andy Jack's policies. Yeah, he seeks out some diplomatic solutions instead of using force when it comes to different financial disputes, and especially between the American citizens and the Mexican government, which, whoa, that's a whole other thing we don't want to unwrap right now. Uh, We'll get to it eventually, in some small extent. Uh, Van Buren also denies Texas's formal request to join the United States. Um, he prefers harmony over territorial expansion, which, by the way, we're also going to get to again in a future episode. Uh, lots of this kind of stuff is going to come back around again. So Van Buren, he sides with the Spanish government to return kidnapped slaves. You remember that movie Amistad? I do remember it. Yep. Yeah. Some of the facts are, quote, facts about Van Buren. Uh, in that movie, have been stated as untruths. That never happens. That's that never that never happens. Mm-mm. Yeah, so it's just some creative license, right? Yep. So he also oversees the movement of Native Americans, following in the footsteps of Andy Jack. How do you like that? Oversaw the movement. Yeah, uh, it makes it sound nice and clean and pretty, but. Uh, That it was not. Yeah. So he continues the war with the Seminole Indians in Florida, and he's got some issues going on with the Mormons in Missouri. Yeah, the Mormons had settled in Independence, Missouri, and then the governor of Missouri was like, hey, by the way, um, get out. 
and <laughs> so there's extermin <laughs> there's this extermination order, and you know who do they who do they seek? But why would they not seek out the president? And then the president doesn't help them. And a lot of people said he just really wanted to get Missouri's votes, so he wasn't going to make anybody in Missouri mad. So he didn't help the Mormons. Yeah, I get this, Ben. He considered slavery immoral, but hey, it's sanctioned by the Constitution, so whatever. Well, I mean, <laughs> it sounds now, looking back and being on the right side of history, it sounds really ridiculous that why would you let it happen if you were for it or if you were against it? But aren't there people that are doing that right now with different issues? No, mm. no. Mm. Big issues. So anyway, let's get into the panic of 1837. Yeah, so the U.S. economy, it is just humming along. The, I was going to say like a nice engine or something like that, but I don't think they had nice engines back then. They might have. It, it, it's possible, but it was humming along like a good carriage should. <laughs> uh, there's lots of silver... <laughs> Coming to the U.S. from Mexico and from China. Do you? Th I bet. I oh, I bet. One of the reasons that America didn't want to make Mexico mad is because of the silver. I just, I mean, not that it's, economics have ever played any any part in political decisions, but maybe. Uh, well, yeah, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So, land sales and tariffs on imports were generating all kinds of revenue for the U.S. And lucrative cotton exports and the marketing of state-backed bonds in the British money markets caused the U.S. to acquire significant capital investments from Great Britain. Yeah, and the bonds financed different transportation projects in the U.S., and then there were loans from the Brits that fueled our westward expansion. And then in 1836, the Bank of England, some of the directors were like, hey, our monetary reserves are declining. What happened? Yeah, and it could be because of the poor wheat harvests that forced Great Britain to import a lot of its food. You know, it's kind of interesting. There was a global weather event in that sea in that era, mm -hmm. which actually caused bad crop growth. <laughs> I don't know what exactly you would call it, but there was actually something going on environmentally yeah. in a, a large part of the world, and so. To compensate, the directors decided that they would raise interest rates from 3 to 5%. And because they raised the interest rates, the banks in the U.S. were forced to do the same. The old ripple effect, right? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, this ripple effect um, really caused the demand for U.S. cotton to plummet because it has to get so high. Uh, but the price falls... By 25% because the demand is low. Mm. So if you haven't taken economics yet, follow along closely. Since the, <laughs> or haven't taken it in a long time, like me, since the US economy, especially uh, in the South, is really heavily dependent upon cotton prices and, and then they either need to be stable or going upwards, uh, it just creates all kinds of problems. Yeah. Everything from funding for schools and the trade deficit and just the value of the dollar. Uh, remember, the U.S. was predominantly an agricultural economy, so it affected just about every aspect of life. The real estate market crashes, and it's just a really, really bad time. So Marty gets in, has his inaugural ball and all that Yay. good stuff. And then five weeks later, panic. <laughs> he, he refuses uh, to have the government intervene in the crisis, which... I could see both sides of that. Uh, Whigs call him Martin Van Ruin, which it's a little mean, but it's kind of funny at the same time. I would, <laughs> we would have called him Marty Van Ruin, but whatever. And yeah. I mean, he just becomes this incredibly easy target for the Whigs to poke fun at and to make fun of. We talk now about how, oh, well, yeah, th we're seeing the ripple effects, positive or negative, of the president before the person. Five weeks is not enough time to screw things up, most likely. Yeah, really. <laughs> but he still gets the brunt of the of the abuse for it. Yeah, and so, hey, you want to talk about the election? I think that's only appropriate. Okay, panic, 1837. Marty is unpopular, and the Democrats are like, I think it's a pretty good idea. Let's go ahead and nominate him again. So in May of 1840, he 
He's like, sure, I'll run again. But his vice president, Richard Mentor Johnson, he's having all kinds of issues. He, some people are saying that the guy is nuts. Uh, some are saying that he's senile. There's a lot of issues. We could actually have a whole podcast about him. Richard Mitchell Johnson, he goes back to Kentucky and runs for some state offices. And um, actually, he was a pallbearer for Daniel Boone hmm. when they reburied Daniel Boone. That's, That's really weird. interesting. But anyway, he comes back to Kentucky. The Whigs, which were a disaster just like a few minutes ago. <laughs> 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 They're like, hey, let's unite and get behind a single candidate. So they do. They nominate the popular retired general, William Henry Harrison from Ohio. Name sounds familiar, right? Yeah. Yeah, he's the most successful of the three Whig candidates from the previous election. So why not? If you're the most successful, why not be the guy? And sure. he's a slave owner, like mm-hmm. most most big names at this point. And he was perceived as being really simple. He's a commoner. Uh, people like him. Yeah. And who better to run with William Henry Harrison than John Tyler, who is from Virginia. They're actually from very close by. Harrison moved out to the West, but they were from really the same part of Virginia. Hey, Jason, you remember those uh, anti-Masonic party people? Yeah, yeah. they were... They they passed on <laughs> during the last election, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Basically, they're still hanging on, but barely. And in 1837, they're they're so sparse that they have to get together and decide whether or not they're still a thing or not. And so, in 1838, in November, they hold a convention and they nominate William Henry Harrison for president and Daniel Webster for vice president. Oh, huh. that sounds like a good idea. Yeah, poor Marty. He's so, so unpopular at this point. Just, just to clarify. The Whigs and the Anti-Masonic Party nominate William Henry Harrison. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. So the Anti-Masonics are like, hey, we're probably going to lose. So let's nominate somebody who's likely going to win. That's smart. Yeah. That's my kind of party, Ben. <laughs> yep, absolutely. So Marty, he's pretty unpopular. And I mean, are the Democrats even going to survive? Um I think we mostly know the answer to that, but let's just pretend like we don't right now. Okay. It's iffy. Yeah, yeah. Harrison iffy runs uh, under the, well, not pretense, but under the title of war hero and man of the people. And they present Van Buren as this wealthy snob living in luxury at the public's expense, which, by the way, <laughs> you voted him into the position where he was able to live in luxury uh Whatever. So Harrison is actually really wealthy himself. He's also really educated, but he, people see him as a commoner, and that becomes his his persona, and he really becomes just really popular. Hey, you know what the best thing to do is when you become really popular? Uh, no, I don't. No, nope. I've never don't. never had the luxury of finding out. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's a tip. Trust me, I know. <laughs> Don't campaign on the issues. Oh. Just go in there with your charisma and build a coalition and get people behind you and speak lots of platitudes and, and you're sure to win. There have been some candidates in the recent past and even present that I've thought may share that idea. Let's just not even talk about the issues. Just vote for me. <laughs> so... The Whigs, their strategy was to win the election by avoiding any difficult discussion about slavery or the National Bank. Uh, Let's just focus on the failed policies of Marty. And Harrison was the first president actually to campaign actively for the office of the president. Yeah. Have you heard the slogan, Tippecanoe and Tyler too? Yeah. All over the place. Because guess where I live? Kentucky. Yeah. But like three blocks away from Cincinnati. That's right. And in Ohio, even though he was, spoiler alert, only president for just a little bit, he's all over the place around here. And there's actually a city in Ohio, just north of Dayton, called Tip City, after this whole Tippecanoe thing, which was actually in Indiana. 
Well, what does that Tippecanoe thing refer to? Yeah, it was a military victory that Harrison had over a group of Shawnee Indians, uh, like I said, back in Indiana in 1811. Eight, 1811? I mean, yeah. that's that means, let's see, if he was old enough to be in charge of something and have military victory in 1811, and now it's 1840, that makes him like 68 years old. You know, yeah, that's you like, like how ancient. I got that math without some of the numbers? <laughs> You're awesome. I know. It's crazy. <laughs> so the Democrats mocked Harrison for being too old to run. He, he's 68, like I said. Uh, they refer to him as Granny. <laughs> they call him senile. Oh. Ouch. Yeah. So one Democratic newspaper even said, Quote, give him a barrel of hard cider and a pension of $2,000 a year, and he will sit the remainder of his days in his log cabin. Yeah, if he's smart, he will. (laughs) The Whigs really did take advantage of the quote, and they declared that Harrison was the log cabin and hard cider candidate, a man (laughs) of the common people from the rough and tumble West. So, you know, somebody calls you a name, embrace it, turn it around. Make it work for you. And they did exactly that. Yeah. So Marty, he's a wealthy snob. He's out of touch with the people. And even though Harrison was the one who came from a family of wealthy planters, and Marty's father was, in fact, a tavern keeper, Harrison, he was the guy who moved to the frontier and for years lived in a log cabin <laughs> while Marty became the well, he became the well-paid government official. So go figure. Yep. yep. But like we said, it's an economic depression. People aren't real happy. They go to vote, and they vote for the guy who is not responsible, whether in reality or impression, responsible for their economic demise. So Harrison wins, and he wins over the Western settlers. He wins over the Eastern bankers, wins a lot of stuff. Yeah, like even in Tennessee. Okay, so Old Hickory, he's over there at the Hermitage, right? Mm-hmm. In Nashville, he's hanging out. He's probably growing some crops and tending the sheep and smoking (laughs) cigars and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. He's stumping for Marty. He's like, come on, guys, let's vote for Marty. No, Harrison still wins in Tennessee. And you can really echo that anywhere and everywhere across the country. But get this, Ben. Van Buren loses the electoral vote, right? Mm Mm-hmm. 234 to 60. Ouch. Yeah. That's a lot. But the popular vote, yeah. Yeah, it's like overwhelming. But the popular vote was only lost by 146,000 votes. That's insane. For the amount of people that were voting, he did not lose by that much. Though the 146,000 is like as many as voted in the whole first election. But that's beside the point. There's a lot more people voting now. But he wins, or he wins those votes in the exact wrong way, a la Al Gore, to get him two hundred thirty-four electoral votes to sixty. So, ouch! He yeah, he does well, but does not get anywhere near winning. So, William Henry Harrison, he's in to pick a new Tyler too. You know what I like more than a good nickname? I don't know. A nickname is a pretty good thing to have. That's true. What's your nickname? Do you have a nickname besides golf? Well. That wasn't my nickname until just now. (laughs) But I do like when somebody gives me a really nice review. And what better place to get a nice review than iTunes? Yeah, CA Toolbox says, Some history podcasts are boring and just stick with the facts. Well, I hope we stick with the facts as much as we can. But uh, And some are closer to the hardcore history style and keep you engaged with colorful details. That first of all, is really, really humbling to be compared to hardcore history at all. Uh, These guys definitely know what they're doing and were able to keep my attention. Definitely recommended. So, hey, thanks, CA Toolbox. We appreciate that. That's really nice of you. That's awesome. I got some warm feelings right there in the heart region. If you want to also leave us a review, we would appreciate it. You can go to electioncollege.com slash review and leave us a nice five star review or four star uh, lower than that I'm not going to recommend it, but at least four star <laughs> <laughs> hey Ben yeah anything else for this episode 
just want to remind people they can find us at electioncollege.com, on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram. Yeah, and like we said, if you like what you hear, please go over to iTunes, give us a review. It really helps us get this program in front of as many people as who would be interested in it. All right, everybody. Thank you very much for listening. This is Ben. And this is Jason. See you next time.